Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. Hi guys, Francois here. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Clear to Send podcast. I'm recording solo today. Uh, Roel worked a lot uh, over the week, so he needed some rest. So I'm, I'm just recording an episode where I'll be talking about Wi-Fi for automated vehicles. And I just wanted to reflect on a project I've, uh, I've worked on. And I wanted to share a couple of things related to that project with you guys. Um, I really, really enjoyed working on that project, and uh, I've discovered a, a few things that I actually wanted to uh, to discuss and, and talk about. So today, we're going to try to focus on that. We're going to try to talk about, you know, anything that's specific to automated vehicles, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the context and, and everything. Uh, right before we begin, I would like to remind you that uh, Roel and I worked on a course uh, which is called the Practical Guide to Site Survey and I actually used uh, most of the um, the content we have in the course for, for that work and it helped me a great bit. If you're interested in taking a look at uh, what we're offering, you can go to courses.cleartosend.net or if you go to the cleartosend.net website, you'll see uh, at the top a menu for the courses. And you can check out what we uh, what we have to offer. Um, also, for this episode, we have the show notes. So if you head over to cleartstand.net slash 237, you'll be able to uh, see uh, a couple of pictures I've uploaded regarding what we're going to talk about today. All right. So just to give you guys an idea of the context, so I got... Um, I got uh, hired by a company to pretty much assess Wi-Fi networks and make sure that they would be ready to, um, you know, to welcome automated guided vehicles in a manufacturing environment, right? So uh, automated guided vehicles, uh, sometimes they're referred as AGV with their acronym. And it's pretty much like robots that moves uh, uh, across the, uh, the plant or the warehouse carrying different loads uh, and everything is automated. So you don't have a driver. They just know where to go. They have defined path uh, and then they connect to the Wi-Fi uh, to, you know, to exchange some data right um so it's it's it, it's yeah, i guess it's at the beginning of the um oh it's part of the iot right it's the you're not you're not designing for a device that someone is carrying someone is using it just you're designing for an automated uh, kind of robot device that moves around moves around the uh, the warehouses and and needs connectivity back to the network so uh so they 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 contacted me to do to do this type of work and i had to do it in two different warehouses uh, for two different customers, making sure that you know the AGV would operate properly when they actually, you know, uh, start using them, um, and uh, it was it was quite interesting um, to to you know to work on that project. Uh, and the way the way I kind of approached it is I, I first I started to you know understand you know how will these AGV connect back to the Wi-Fi so. You know, I started to ask questions, uh, trying to find out, you know, what type of Wi-Fi NIC do they have? Um, you know, what are the capabilities of that Wi-Fi NIC? Uh, what type of drivers and so on? So I could have a better understanding of what type of hardware they're using. Um, and I quickly, quickly realized that they're not using a, a typical, you know, Wi-Fi NIC to connect to those AGV back to the network. They actually use... A wireless client bridge, so it's kind of like a, 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 a small access point that you'll use to connect back to the Wi-Fi network. And behind that wireless bridge, you can actually connect devices. So they have like a built-in uh, mini switch, if you will, or just the Ethernet port that gives you a connection back to the uh, to the network. And then so behind that bridge, you can connect, you know, your devices, your laptop. You can connect a module. You can connect a switch, and so on. So that's pretty much what they were doing. They had this wireless client bridge that would connect back to the Wi-Fi, and then behind that wireless client bridge, inside the AGV, they had all of their devices connected to that and retrieving network access. All right, so that was that was uh, uh, very interesting, and and what I did. Um, before going on site, I actually, um, you know, purchased one of those wireless client bridge because I wanted to do some 
uh, some preliminary work on it and try to understand, you know, how do they see the signal, trying to understand, you know, how do they, uh, how do you, how do you configure them? Um, will I be able to configure them and, you know, on site to connect to the Wi-Fi and do some testing and so on. So that was, that, that's kind of like the, what I did behind the scene to kind of get myself ready for the, for the work. Um, also, when you when you work on this type of environment, um, some some a couple of things are very specific to these automatic gated vehicles, um, and the one that was I guess that was the most important, or not the most important, but just the the a, a, a very unusual one is the fact that you know these devices are very low to the ground, uh, so it's it, it's you know robots that just carry loads, but. Uh, they carry the load on top of them and they're very low to the ground. And so the antenna and that, that's going to send and receive the Wi-Fi signal is also very low to the ground. And you have to take that into account when you do your assessment. So when I did my survey, when I went on site and I did my survey, I actually needed to find a way to kind of wear my psychic where the psychic was very low to the ground. Um, and so... The, the way I ended up doing doing it is I used um, a, a backpack that allowed me to go very low and then I attached the psychic, um, you know, at the end of this backpack. So I was able to bring my psychic as low as possible so it could be roughly at the same height uh, of the, you know, the antenna used by the AGV. And I, I, I added a picture to the show notes so you guys can take a look at it and, and hopefully it makes it makes sense, but that was kind of like my solution or the solution that I found to to make this happen. Obviously, it wasn't the the you know the most convenient thing because as I was working, it was kind of you know bouncing around a little bit. I was trying to be as steady as possible. I would be better to have like a, some sort of rigid stick that brings it you know closer to the ground. Um, but I didn't have time to engineer something before going on site for the for this work. Uh, and I think it was it was pretty good. Um, I, I I ended up you know having uh, good results to doing it like this. I just had to be careful what I was you know walking around in those environments, making sure I knew where I was walking and so on. Um, but that's that's something you have to keep in mind. Uh, you know, for the most part, when we do our surveys, we surveys for mobile devices or we surveys for devices that are going to be used as as at waist height so we don't really overthink the process we just wear the psychic normally in this case uh we had to be mindful about that um because the antenna is low to the ground the second thing we had i had to be mindful is the load what type of load is carried by the agv um and the way the way it worked is you have the agv and on top of the agv you have this sort of metal frame with wheels and then on top of that metal frame was wheels, they put the load, all right? And then the antenna is, if you have a whole bunch of, of things on the AGV, right, on the frame, metal frame, the antenna is kind of like, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it's underneath all of this. It's not, it, they, didn't, they didn't put the antenna underneath the load. They, ha- they have it at the front of the AGV. But if the AP is behind the AGV, then the signal has to go through that load, right? So that's another work I did when I went on site. I tried to understand what type of load they would carry. And then I would measure the attenuation of these loads. So I did, I did measure the attenuation of the loads. Uh, in the first environment, they were carrying a lot of plastic parts. And um, the, the uh, attenuation ended up being roughly 2 dB uh, in average. In the second environment, they were carrying a little bit like metal pieces but they were not like super compact they had like you know free space around them and the attenuation uh, ended up being uh 3 db in average right so and then that, that's something i tried to incorporate into my validation data so we can kind of measure the worst case scenario uh you know what's going to happen when the agv will be fully loaded and most of the time they'll be fully loaded when they travel around the path so it's something that uh, it's also good to keep in mind when you do those sort those sort of uh, of assessments. All right. So if I go back to try to understand, you know, how I organize my work, uh, first thing I did is before going on site, I tried to gather and and we explained that process in the course in greater details. But I tried to uh, gather information about the wireless network infrastructure of the customer so you know i usually try to ask 
you know, for the configs of the controllers. In 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 the work I've done uh, for this, you know, for this particular project, um, I was dealing with two different type of infrastructures for the two customers. One had Cisco, the other one had Meraki. So we had to I had to adjust a little bit my questions, but I I, bet, I pretty much tried to get information about the RF environment. I tried to find out the channels used by the APs. Tried to find out the transmit powers. Um, and and the configuration of the SSID that we actually care about, the SSID that the AGV will connect to. So try to get all of that data in advance uh, so I can have a rough idea. Obviously, I had the flow plans. And when you work with AGV, something that's specific about the flow plans will be the AGV path. So those, those um, devices have defined path. So they, they actually always go the same <laughs> the same route and they are, that's something that's programmed into them obviously they have sensors and all of this so they can you know stop if you walk in front of them and stuff like that but they have defined path so um, uh, the, the way it would work is you would you know put the load on it press a button and then it would go to the next section and pick up more stuff or deliver some 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 uh, uh, goods um, and so this path is defined. Uh, on the flow plan and when i was working with my customer they you know highlighted the the, the path for the agv and that was kind of like my scope of work can you make sure that the wi-fi will be good alongside the um you know the agv path um so that's something that we needed to include into you know the first defining step of the of the project making sure everyone went, uh, was understanding the scope of a uh, scope of work um, and then when I got the flow plans, you know, I could I was able to prepare my Ekaha project files before going on site. And then something that I did as well before going on site was the uh, the analysis of the wireless client bridge. So the the one they were using is uh, uh, HB Aruba five hundred one wireless client bridge. I think it's a uh, it's um, HP like uh, it's uh, you know a legacy of HP type of devices, uh, but it's very um, robust it's very well built it's like all metal uh, and i had a really good experience working with it but what i wanted to understand before going on site is how does this client bridge see the signal compared to my psychic and i wanted to calculate those offsets so i could apply those offsets to my measurements when i go on site and so i did those offsets uh, calculations um um in my in my office uh kind of different locations try to get a, a better accuracy of what I was measuring, and um, and I did it using you know the built-in antenna that um, that comes within the uh, the wireless client bridge, which is like omnidirectional little stick antennas. They have three of them. Uh, the AP is uh, the AP is actually uh, the client bridge is actually a three spatial stream device, and so I did it that way. Um, later on, when I went on site, I realized that they actually were using a different type of antenna, so. I'm aware that my calculation might be a little off, but regardless, I had a good idea of you know how everything was set up, um, and I had a good idea of of you know what type of offset to to uh, yeah, you know to expect uh, to see when I was uh, when I would go on site. So I I did all of that work and I was ready to go. And the way I did that work is I actually I used my PoE battery, uh, which is very convenient in these scenarios because what I could do is I could power I could power on the wireless bridge using my PoE battery and then on the second port of the battery I could just connect my uh, uh, my laptop and then give my laptop an IP address and then I could actually open an HTTP uh, S session to the wireless client bridge and I could configure it there um, and the configuration was uh, pretty straightforward I found out a couple of tools that were neat in the uh, in the interface. They have a tool where you can actually monitor the RSSI. Uh, so it will tell you the RSSI that it retrieves from the AP it's currently connected to. It will tell you the BSSID. It will tell you the channel it's connected to, and it will give you the RSSI. Um, and you can change the interval. Uh, so what I would do when I was doing my testing is I would change the interval to like one second. So I could get every second, I could get an idea of what type of signal I would get. And that's, that's what I used to do my offset measurements and also used that when I was uh, when I went on site. I'll talk about that in, in a bit. 
and then they also had a couple of other features in the uh, in the web interface. You could configure different SSID profiles, um, and you could configure a couple of RF details. Um, I didn't I didn't uh, play too much uh, with this. I just uh, applied what the customer was using to try to get the close as close to what they were using as possible. Uh, but the the box is. Uh, is, is compatible with 2.15, it prefers 5 gigahertz from what I've seen. Um, and uh, yeah, I had, I had, you know, good grips of how to configure it and how to work with it. Once it was configured, I tested it with like a net, like my Wi-Fi network that I have at, um, at home. What happened is the, the wireless client bridge connected to my Wi-Fi network um, and then I lost, um, you know, access to the management interface. Uh, so you're not, I wasn't able to connect to the management interface through my Wi-Fi network. Uh, and so what I had to do is I had to take my laptop and connect it behind the bridge now. So it became like a device behind the bridge. Um, and then it retrieved an IP address from the DHCP. And then from that laptop device behind the bridge, I was able to actually open HTTPS connection to the bridge and and start configuring it uh, or, or just the configurations. So that that was kind of like my experience, you know, prior going on site, making sure I had an understanding on how to configure the device. Um, and also what I did is I had the SSIDs, right, from the customer. So what I did is I preloaded the SSID profile inside the the unit that I had, my test unit. So when I when I went on site, I could automatically start uh, testing if the device would connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, so that's also what I did before going on site. I went on site. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the security measures, but they had a couple of security measures I had to to go through uh, for for this type of environment and because of COVID. Um, and then what I did pretty much when I arrived on site is I had an understanding of I talked to the customer to have a better understanding of the AGV path and what they were trying to accomplish and and so on. Um, and then I was able to do my a site survey, right? So I did a site survey with the Psychic and my iPad to try to map out the signal strength in that area along the AGV path. And I tried to walk a little bit more than just the AGV path. Uh, I wanted to have a little bit more uh, data, especially just uh, if they had like access points that were not right above the path, but that could still service the path. I wanted to have a better understanding of this. So I kind of walked around uh, and then when I was done, uh, I tried to analyze if it was good, bad, um, to get an idea of w what to expect. Uh, and then after that, what I did is I tried, I took, I took my test unit, the wireless client bridge test unit, and then I tried to connect it to the SSID that was, you know, uh, going to be used for the AGV. So, um, the and it worked it worked in both cases it works it was very smooth so what i would do is i would take my poe battery again uh, actually i would strap my a the client bridge on top of the poe battery already connected i would just power it on and then uh, behind the bridge i would just connect my laptop and then i had you know a static ip that i was using um, to just connect back to the bridge so i was doing this uh, and I was trying to use the IP addressing that were going to be used by the AGV to test internet connection and so on. So I was pretty much doing this. And then with, a cl with my laptop connected behind the bridge, I could just you know open up the admin page of the client bridge and I could check if everything was fine. I could check if you know the, the, the client bridge would connect to the Wi-Fi. I would check you know on which channels, 5 gigahertz, 2.4 you know, the BSSID. And so I used that to kind of validate that first, who he was able to connect to the Wi-Fi. And second, I was validating, you know, if it was working at 2.4, 5 gigahertz, uh, and so on. So that's that's some of the, you know, quick validations uh, I, I did directly from the test unit. And then after that, what I wanted to understand is the roaming uh, pattern. Um, um, and then try to see if I could adjust and optimize the, the roaming. So I did a lot of walking and, and checking alongside the AGV path to try to understand when, um, you know, the unit was roaming. Uh, 
And then I did different tests uh, um, adjusting the roaming threshold settings that they have on those units to try to find the best, uh, the best one for the environment. Um, and it was interesting to see, you know, when the device was roaming, it was interesting to see, you know, the, which frequency bands he was preferring. Uh, and in, in these, in the, for my testing, I almost always connected to five gigahertz, even though sometimes the society was broadcasting on two, on both frequency band. Uh, and we had, luckily we had enough five gigahertz, uh, uh, signal. I didn't have too much coverage issues in those works. So there was, it was great. I was able to adjust the roaming threshold and, and, and work on that. So that was, that was a really, really great. I had, you know, good experience doing this. Um, and then on site after I was, you know, I would do those type of work. Uh, I also did some, you know, the attenuation work to understand how much the load would attenuate the signal, so I can apply that to my to my site survey results. Um, and yeah, and then I had to do a couple of more work, like documentations and taking pictures and all. So I did I did all of that on work on on site, and uh, it worked it worked pretty well. On the second project, we actually changed I changed the roaming thresholds a little bit because the first time around. Uh, the, the unit didn't roam at all with the default setting. I think it was minus 75 dBm. And so I, I played with the roaming threshold. Uh, I think I changed it to minus 65. Uh, it was a little too drastic because then the unit started to roam too much. So uh, we did, I did more adjustment to kind of find the sweet spot um, that I communicated back to the customer. But it's, uh, it's interesting. It was interesting work. Uh, to try to find find out and and, and tweak those uh, settings, uh, and I'm sure it can be helpful in in those environment. Um, yeah, but overall, I had a really good experience uh, working with these devices. Uh, it's it's really cool. And then what what I what I noticed when I went on site is they didn't have the same. They they were not using the default antennas for the uh, for the AGV. And so I asked the customer and they gave me the the reference for the antenna they use. And the antenna they use is actually interesting because it's uh, it's an omnidirectional antenna on the horizontal plane, but on the vertical plane, it only goes up. So it, it's, it's kind of like the contrary of a um, down tilt omnidirectional antenna. Uh, it's just meant to be, you know, facing up and all the signal goes up. So it's like an up tilt omnidirectional antenna. Uh, and it has a gain of uh, 4 dBi, which was, I think, a little bit more than what I had on the uh, on the default Omni antennas. Uh, and it's a three; it supports three by three MIMO, uh, just like the just like the unit. So it's uh, I wasn't too worried um, uh, when I did my survey because I think they'll get even better signal with this uh, antenna. It's, it's, uh, it's a great radiation pattern for these environments. All the signal will go up, which is where we want it to go, and it will just listen to the signal coming down from the APs. Uh, so I think, I think uh, I'm pretty confident. I, I love the fact that they were using really good hardware on the AGV. I didn't find any, you know, crappy one stream Wi-Fi NIC hidden inside the mailbox. Uh, it was actually very well engineered. Uh, the solution was very well engineered. They used, like I told you, you know, HPE equipment for the Wi-Fi client bridge, uh, which has a lot of flexibility and re and is well built and reliable. And then they used a really good antenna uh, on the, that's lo actually located on top of the AGV, right? So you'll be able to see it on the picture. So they actually engineered the solution very well. Um, to, to work with Wi-Fi networks, so I was I was happily surprised to see to see to see all of this, uh, and just it just goes to show that you know I guess the wa the wireless connectivity is, is critical for these for these devices. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think I think I I pretty much covered everything I did over there. Uh, it was a good project for me. Uh, I ended up purchasing one of these antennas. I want to do more work, uh, more tests for myself. Um, maybe the customer will contact me again to assess other uh, other warehouses, and and I'll be able to just bring that on site and have like a one to one comparison to, to you know to what they actually use. Uh, so when I do my roaming analysis and and signal strength analysis, I'll have even you know better and more accurate results. 
All right. So that's kind of what what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Uh, different things, uh, different environments in which Wi-Fi will you know will be important. Different use cases, um, and just you know when you work with different use cases, you can have a little things you need to adjust in your workflow, uh, little things you need to uh, refine, and things you have to take into consideration. So hopefully that helps you guys out to try to you know. Um, you know, work on, on your upcoming Wi-Fi projects and try to keep everything in mind, take everything into into consideration to uh, to do, you know, thorough analysis and, and studies. All right, so I hope you, you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, if you want to check, check out the pictures in the show notes, you can head over to cleartostand.net slash 237. If you want to check out the course where we talk about, you know, site surveys and give you a practical guide on how to do Wi-Fi site surveys, you can head over to courses.clearsend.net. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your support as always. And if you think uh, this episode would be useful for your peers or some of your friends, feel free to share it to uh, share it with them on, on social media and so on. All right. So this was Francois Verge. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. And we'll see you guys in the next episode next week. Bye-bye.